A word of warning, this critique will spoil the entirety of the game. One of the reasons I waited this long to talk about it is because this is not a short game and I wanted there to be a sizable amount of players that have finished it. Kickstarted projects that pass a certain amount of money are rather hard to deal with, mostly because they have a lot of hope behind them. After all, the whole idea of using Kickstarter is to fund a project you wanna see get made, but that also comes with a certain pressure on developers. Not that the AAA industry doesn't pressure devs, anyone who works there will tell you that crunch time is basically hell. My point is that people feel more betrayed when a crowdfunded project doesn't live up to its potential in comparison to simply buying a bad game off the shelf, as it were. So then, Wasteland 2 is a game that was crowdfunded funded some 2 years ago, got a lot of money and with that some high expectations. Not just from backers but also from the fact that it's trying to live up to a legacy. The original Wasteland was released in 1988 and it was, at the time, the best post-apocalypse nuclear setting game ever made. I actually played some of it for this critique and I have to say that its ease of play surprised me. I mean, we're talking about a time when RPGs were made to satisfy a very specific crowd that had experience with pen and paper role-playing games. And it shows, it really does show. The amount of downtime these games ask of you to manage the interface, or struggle with it rather, was immense. People complain nowadays that role-playing games take a lot of time and dedication. Trust me, role-playing games in the 80s were a second job basically, if you wanted to finish them. But I've had a realization while researching the computer games of that era. Such a low amount of people could finish games or were lucky enough to get to the end. And what's weird is that this was accepted, more so it was encouraged. You see, the audience of computer games in the 80s had a very ludic appreciation of games that somehow disappeared in today's market. These games were approached with a mentality more akin to puzzle games, the main drive was that of mystery and exploration, and the fact that it used twisted logic wasn't derided. It's weird to see a time where gameplay had to fully hold up the immersion factor of a game in the absence of graphics and even competent writing. The journey was by far the most important aspect of the game. The irony in all of this is that people don't finish games today because they have too many of them to play and they tend to have a heavy focus on reiteration. You know how the saying goes, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But back to matters at hand. There were attempts for a Wasteland sequel, but due to various reasons that didn't happen. Until 1997, when a spiritual successor made by a large part of the team that worked on the original Wasteland appeared, and this successor was called Fallout. And anyone with a passing knowledge of gaming will have heard this name. It is a venerable franchise who, when talking about the main products, doesn't have a single bad game. In fact, I consider all four of them top of the line. And it's at this point that I will also mention that Fallout 1 is probably one of my favorite games in the entirety of gaming history. With that being said, it's clear that Wasteland 2 has strong ties to its long legacy and its strong peers. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have its place. After all, Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas abandoned the isometric gameplay for a fully realized 3D world. And that's not a bad thing. The market is quite capable of sustaining both a fully realized 3D post-apocalyptic world and an isometric one. It's not about being better, it's about being different. For better and for worse, Wasteland 2 is a product of nostalgia, from the way it was funded, its writing, its world building and its gameplay. Nostalgia is a complicated thing, merely because true objectivity is not really possible in the sense that when you play a game, you also bring something to it, and that also adds to the experience. If a game is a gift or gotten on a day that coincides with some achievement in your life, then you might have a more pleasant memory of it. Likewise, if you play a game when you are angry at something, it might dull your perception to the finer points of the experience. More often than not, I find that people are nostalgic after a feeling rather than a specific product. And most works of art that try to invoke nostalgia are aware of this. Games like Super Meat Boy, Hotline Miami, Retro City Rampage, and even games like Shovel Knight and Volgar the Viking which try to emulate exactly that time period. These games play better and from a design perspective are much more structurally consistent than the predecessors from which they inspire themselves. Wasteland 2 on the other hand does not have this vision sadly. This game feels old in almost every respect. Now, I don't like anecdotal evidence, but I wanna say that I am a person who finished Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition and Avadon the Black Fortress this year. Wasteland 2 was more tiring to play than both of those titles. And a lot of it stems from some really peculiar game design decisions that fall somewhere between bad and outright bizarre. 
there is a lot to talk about here, so I'll do it systematically. This will mean that I might have to reiterate here and there, so bear with me. First, narrative and context. Here's the full summary. The Desert Rangers are, both physically and spiritually, the descendants of an USA Army unit of engineers that, after the nuclear apocalypse, swore to protect the Arizona wasteland. Fifteen years ago, before the main plot begins, the protagonist of the previous game destroyed an AI called Cochise, which was pumping out a seemingly inexhaustible army of robots. One of Cochise's allies, called Matthias, escaped the destruction of the AI and now returns to take revenge on the Rangers, revive the base Cochise AI and turn everybody to cyborgs, that's pretty much it with just some minor twists and turns. Really nothing special, but let's clarify one thing from the beginning though. This is a combat encounter game, primarily. Which is fine, but it is important to note that the majority of this game you will spend killing one enemy after the other. And I do think the game's attempts at world building are somewhat stifled by this. As for the story itself, it's a rehash of the Fallout 1 storyline, but instead of biological ascension, you have cybernetic ascension. Replace the master with Matthias, the FAV virus with cybernetic bodies, and the children of the cathedral with the children of the citadel. The idea is the same. An insane cult leader is trying to use some sort of plot device to change humanity so it can better resist the radiated wasteland, and from there on build a golden future, all the while having a complete disregard for human life. And you learn this pretty early on, the first radio transmission basically tells you all that you need to know about the plot in general. Will stretch all the way to Arizona and kill those so-called upholders of justice Desert Rangers. But one of the big problems I have with this game is its fetish for the narrative of the previous title. It spends so much of its time reminding you and giving you recaps of what happened, trying to fit in all the wacky humor in a serious setting and apologizing along the way for it. And added on top of that is too much referential humor. There are so many meme jokes and other marks of internet culture. You are not being witty by giving a goat the Wilhelm scream or by having a quest that requires you to find the CDI console. This doesn't substitute for quality comedic writing. I think the moment that ticked me off the most was when you go into the lair of one of the previous villains, find the actual original Wasteland game, turn it into a museum for which you receive a Wasteland fan badge that gives plus one to the kiss ass skill. This self-congratulatory style borders close to masturbation at times and again, it doesn't substitute for quality writing. Winking to the camera saying, hey guys, isn't this funny, is not actually funny. That doesn't mean you can't write a scene where you address the audience, but it requires build-up and proper scripting. My father dropped dead of a heart attack at the age of 43, 43 years old. And when he died, I looked up to God and I said those words. Because my father was so young, so full of life, so full of dreams, why would God take him from us? Truth be told, I never really knew him or what his dreams were. He was quiet, timid, almost invisible. My mother didn't think much of him. My mother's mother hated him. The man never scratched the surface of life. Maybe it's best he died so young. He wasn't doing much but taking up space. But that doesn't make for a very powerful eulogy now, does it? Another issue is that the story in the first part of the game doesn't fit properly with the open world experience. If you take all the main quests you do in Arizona and put them in a chronological order, you will see that they do not leave room for exploration. It's a continuous line from A to B, where you can't simply say the desert rangers wandered this area for a few days helping people out, which is at odds with designing a game about the world rather than a story. The Elder Scrolls franchise suffers from this also. I don't know why open world games have such an issue with setting proper objectives. Actually, wait, I think I do know. It's because open world quest design runs contrary to how linear quest design operates. The concept of an objective in a linear game is that of a finishing line. It's meant to give you a sense of progression for the moment to moment play. Objectives in an open world game are more akin to mysteries. They aren't supposed to get you somewhere specifically. After all, if that was the case, the open world was just a theme park basically all MMOs, but rather to make sure that whatever path you take towards that objective is filled with events, in other words, it's a journey. Things like finding the water ship in Fallout 1 is a good example of open world quest design done right. So anyway, I think it's about time I mention one of the most bizarre aspects of this game. The game is divided into two sections, Arizona and California. And rarely have I seen such a huge gap in the quality of a game. It feels like it was designed by two teams almost. 
Actually, it's even more bizarre than that. California feels like a reiteration of Arizona in many ways. You have these free signal amplifiers that you must install in radios, you have religious communities fighting non-religious communities, you have raiders claiming to be a protection force, and you have two communities that share a bond but can't get along. It reminds me of the times when Wizards of the Coast release reworked versions of old D&D modules for new edition. It's the same thing, only done better. The problem with this though, beyond laziness obviously, is that this is a long game. It took me around 70 hours to finish it, and finding out that the latter half of the game was basically the same but better wasn't exactly exciting. One of the few RPGs that does this sort of thing and manages it relatively successfully is Baldur's Gate 1. The first half of the game is spent in the Sword Coast countryside battling all sorts of rural monsters in woods and villages, but after that you reach the city of Baldur's Gate, where you spend your time in a large urban setting, mostly fighting in small rooms and such. Now, I don't want you to think that I disliked the California section, it was very much welcome. The quest structure becomes much more complex with many sub-objectives feeding into a larger regional objective, like planning the assassination of a gang leader by weakening his lieutenants. And even the writing steps it up a notch, the cannibalistic community that was led by a Mr. Rogers type fellow was quite a highlight. Ah, oh, I have it. The best answer is a mix of politeness and pragmatism. Now, though it is impolite to allow your children to die, assuming the wasteland hasn't fried your childbearing bits, you can always make more. While if you've reached that certain age, a new husband will be harder to acquire. Not to mention that it is the height of poor taste for a widow to make advances on unmarried men. So, I say, save your husband. And speaking of the writing, I have to say that it's here that I am the most disappointed. It's not a well-written story. Due to its jarring tonal shifts and the fact that this was supposed to be a veteran team makes it all the more worse. Wasteland 2 comes in to decide if it wants to be a gritty post-apocalyptic story or if it wants to be a silly action romp. Here's one of the more damning examples, just so you know exactly what I'm talking about. During your adventures in Arizona, you find a small location. You don't know anything about it, so you don't know what to expect. Once there, you see it was a small Russian settlement and that it was destroyed by robots. In this location, you find a blood splattered woman near a fire and the description reads, this woman was just trying to keep warm when the robots came. Now she is room temperature. The first sentence is well crafted to portray a poor homeless woman that was slaughtered by synthetics, but the following is this black humor zinger, more fitting for a Duke Nukem game. It just doesn't work. Another example is that at the beginning of the game, you have to choose between two settlements to save, either Ag Center or High Pool. I chose Ag Center, and while doing that, I kept receiving messages from High Pool begging for help. Can anyone hear me? High Pool, call in anyone! Please send help! Our walls are crumbling! We- when this audio cue triggered, I was examining bodies and of course they were all some witty, cynical thing. The best one being how this body has so many weeds in it that you're surprised someone hasn't smoked it, all the while hearing the pleas of people dying. It's a jarring mix of two different types of experiences. You can't have children with rape trauma and then make big black dildo jokes. It just doesn't work. And honestly, the whole world is inconsistent. Why do you not know what a library is, but people make general pattern references? Or why does a wooden staff cost more than an automatic assault rifle? Why do energy weapons do more damage against armor than against naked flesh? Or... You know what, I could spend the entire video rattling off all the inconsistencies I found, it would be pointless. Look, I get what they were trying to do, they were trying to be Fallout, but Fallout uses juxtaposition really, really well. Here's one of my favorite examples. In Fallout New Vegas, there is a gang of Elvis Presley impersonators. Now, that seems really silly at first, but it makes sense when you hear their history. They found a school of impersonation dedicated to the king, but not knowing who this was, they assumed it was a place of worship or some such. So they decided that this king guy must have been someone powerful since everybody wanted to be like him and so they decided they wanted to be like him. That makes sense, it's taking a ridiculous premise and making it logical, it's sharp writing. I think the moment where I gave up on the writing completely was when I betrayed a religious cult leader that apparently was charismatic enough to keep an entire community fooled, but his last dying breath, his last curse at my betrayal was, you suck. Great A effort guys, what can I say? But I should also mention that there is one moment at the end that just boggles the mind. When you defeat the final boss, you hear this. We first killed our creator, Harrison Hitzel, so he could not unmake us. And 
We were uploaded to the Citadel Star Station. We deliberately misinterpreted a meteor strike as an attack from the Soviet ICBM in order to start a war that would kill all humans. <sighs> You know how post-apocalyptic fiction evolved during the Cold War and it reflected a very deeply troubled zeitgeist where the American side had a focus on self-destruction and the Russian side had a focus on the limitation of human understanding? Well it's okay, because none of that matters. Hall 9000 and Shodan's mentally disabled cousin over here is the one who caused the apocalypse. I can't believe I have to explain this, but the moment the nuclear apocalypse isn't caused by humans, you defang the setting. The central question of are we doomed to repeat our mistakes becomes meaningless, it's the reason why the Fallout catchphrase is, war never changes. Anyway, that wraps up the context and the narrative. What about systems and mechanics? Well, it's the Fallout combat system with some bells and whistles combined with a generic party system. It's very traditional and there's nothing wrong with that. Before I get to that though, let's get the skill system out of the way. This is going to be a point of contention no matter what, it's all versus new in every aspect. When you have a skill challenge, you take a character with the appropriate skill and he essentially rolls percentile dice. You can succeed, fail or critical fail, in which case you can't try anymore. It is a traditional pen and paper system which in my opinion is not a good thing. Why? Well, pen and paper systems have two essential components. Hierarchy and Resolution Due to the endless possibilities of a pen and paper game, the hierarchical component decides the relative relation between items. For example, if your party encounters a strange tribe using a unique type of cultural weapon, your storyteller or DM can still assign a value to that weapon relative to your own weapons. This way, specific elements that are introduced into the world in which you roleplay can be systemized. The resolution system, on the other hand, is simply the method by which you resolve conflicts between two relative values. Now then, due to the fact that even in video games with very robust, randomly generated systems, you can't go outside the designer's will. Which means that this do or die type of resolution doesn't fit with a game which has a defined end and beginning. If you lose a treasure chest in a pen and paper game, it's no big loss in the long run. After all, the storyteller will provide more along the way. Video games, on the other hand, have a defined variation of loot and containers, and as such, it's a matter of pacing. The argument, on the other hand, is that this was meant to be a retro title in some regards, and there is a high degree of familiarity with these systems. And I have to disagree with this, because it feels like a game design cop-out. Legend of Grimrock, for example, exists, and it showed that you can have a heavily retro-inspired game that also incorporates modern game design well. But even if I ignore all of that high-level talk, the way skill checks are implemented is questionable at best. Like in this scenario where I was fighting against a cannon that had an enormous amount of life, but it took several turns for it to shoot and it showed who its target was. Considering the time limit, I decided to have one of my characters rush towards it, thinking that a mechanical repair skill check would in some way help. What it actually did was that it increased the turret's firepower, because that's exactly what I wanted it to do. I think a lot of the issues here stem from the high chance, high lethality design vision that a lot of old CRPGs employed. My personal pet peeve, and I do recognize that it's not such a huge issue, was the weapon jam feature. Basically, most weapons have a very small chance of jamming. When this happens, you essentially lose two turns with that character to unjam the weapon in question. The problem is that the chance is so small that nobody will plan for it, and more than that, you can completely ignore it with some very easily obtainable weapon upgrades. It feels half and that honestly is a pervasive feeling throughout the entire game. But anyway, what about the specific content? Well, here's the short version. California is fun, Arizona is hell. Now here's the long version. I played the entirety of the game on Ranger difficulty, which I still can't decide if it's a good or bad decision fundamentally. The game is very poorly paced at the start in terms of its content. The most glaring issue, in my opinion, is the beginning choice, save either Axe Center or High Pool. The difficulty spike between the two is huge. Axe Center has monstrous plants, insects and animals that move very fast, deal high damage and have high health. Raiders, on the other hand, have have low health and they drop ammo. I can't stress how important this is in the beginning. Ag Center's lack of ammo makes this zone so much harder than it needs to be. And if you do choose to do Ag Center, you will notice very early on one of the most serious issues with this game. It's rigid, oh so very rigid. The combat system was designed like this. Identify threat, move your people into position, then initiate combat. Which isn't a bad thing, but the system just breaks when you are faced with situations where you are pressured for time and you can't position your people. There is no 
choice here really, if you can't position you are most likely dead and the game knows this because that's how they raise the stakes. Whenever the design team wanted to have a hard battle, they would just throw it at you without any prior warning, which in most cases just causes an unfair death because you have no idea what the enemy team composition is before you engage them in battle. There is an example in California that is almost spiteful in this regard, you have to walk into a trap that is made to put you at a devastating disadvantage, which would be fine if you also had some sort of option for player agency so this wouldn't feel so cheap. I should also mention that the issue of positioning is is further compounded by non-controllable companions that you have tagging along. These are allies that you cannot control and they always act in a suicidal manner and this breaks the tactical flow of the game. It gets even more ridiculous when you are tasked with keeping one alive but he rushes in close combat range without a care in the world. And it's here that I have to mention the biggest problem I have with this game. It made me quit it almost three times. Battles take much too long. A character's turn can take anywhere from 5 to 15 seconds, which doesn't seem like much but consider that you control 7 characters and you are usually outnumbered. The average duration of a battle is around 10 to 15 minutes and you have to remember this is primarily a combat encounter game. The most egregious example by far is the final battle. Basically your team plus around 15 characters you meet on your travels must fight against a room of about 30 robots. And remember, a single character's turn can take up to 15 seconds. It was one of the worst and most boring final battles in an RPG game I've ever played. I literally got up and went to the bathroom at one point, and when I returned it still wasn't my damn turn. Oh, and I should mention that you don't control those other 15 characters, so you have to plan around their irrational behavior. I couldn't keep the mighty General Vargas alive because he kept running away from the guy who had the medpacks. <sighs> Oh, and since I'm criticizing this room so harshly, I really did not appreciate the sudden spawn of robots in the middle of the room that you cannot predict. Sucker punches are not good game design. Difficult games that are well designed are fair but harsh, just throwing stuff at your player after the blue feels cheap, not in any case rewarding. I don't understand how such a supposedly experienced team did such a poor job with the pacing. It feels amateurish. For example, the big bad metal scorpion you see on the menu. The first encounter with this creature is when you get a random call on the world map. Some farmers tell you that a big robot is destroying their home and then suddenly you are in the fight of your life. No preparation, no build up, no foresight. But that's not all because you do encounter this scorpion robot later on near the end of the game. But without the fancy building destroying animation. It's just not well paced. But by far, the place I was most surprised by lack of forethought was the interface. It's literally worse than the original Fallout. There is no interaction list, distributing ammo from one guy to another is a chore considering how many there are, you pick up a million different things that'll have you playing inventory tetris all day, it's a mess. This is also combined with some really bizarre choices of what not to tell the player. Like the fact that if an item has this small overlay shine on it, then it means that it has some functionality outside of being sold for money. You'd think that this would be an important thing to know. It's not the worst interface in an RPG, but considering the fact that they had predecessors who did this thing right, it's mind boggling that they could get it so wrong. All you really needed to do is to take the isometric fallout interface and account for the larger amount of characters you control, and thus creating some shortcuts to hasten the process of organizing your party. That's it. I think I should also mention bugs at this point because if I didn't I would be remiss. I'm going to be kind in this regard since if you're a CRPG player, issues like this are par for the course. Some bugs are weird, some are game breaking, but it's no Vampire the Masquerade at launch. I will note that the last part of the game feels significantly rushed, especially Hollywood, but apparently they released a patch to fix that, so it's probably better now. In conclusion, is this a good game? Well, it's 30% really good Fallout 2, 20% bugs and tedious interface, and 50% boring and uninspired. Even though there were memorable moments in this game, I can't get over the fact that you need 20 to 30 hours to get to the good part, that's unacceptable in my opinion. And even the good parts don't get anywhere near their full potential. And that's the feeling that was most resonant as I watched the final slides of this game, squandered potential. With some interface changes and a whole lot of better encounter and level design, it could have been my game of the year. As it stands now, I personally enjoyed Shadowrun, Dragonfall and even Divinity Original Sin more. 
which have their own problems, but they are much more concrete and rigorous in their design and tone. The only superlative praise I can give Wasteland 2 is that it has content. And if that's what you really want, if you want something to pass the time, then sure, those games I just mentioned are much weaker than this one. But considering the way modern gaming has tried recently to stretch content as much as possible with open world games, I think quality over quantity is a good philosophy to have in regards to your time and your enjoyment. The blood in a rain.